Welcome to another episode of our personal empowerment audio program, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder. And our program today is entitled The Driving Force. We're talking about the basic fears, the basic concerns, the basic issues faced by the ego. There are a couple of phrases that we can use and introduce you to. One is stream of consciousness. Another is a thought stream or a train of thought, a, a train of thinking. And the thought stream, sort of a liquid version of the train. And again, the stream of consciousness, the idea that there is this flow of thoughts in your mind, often in the back of your mind, sometimes you bring it forward, even when we're not applying our mental nature to a particular task, like reading. Say you put that down, then you stop reading, or balancing your checkbook, or studying a train schedule, or making some sort of decision. We could call that applied thinking. But when you put that down, there still is the flow or the train, right? What is that? Well, that level of conscious awareness is basically the ego or the personality, and It focuses essentially on three things. Steve and I have been talking about this in the last few weeks and months. And What does the ego do? What are the three things that the personality reflects upon or is driven by that happens even when our thinking is not applied? First, the most important concept is the basic job of the ego is to protect us. It's to help us to survive. So what the ego is basically doing is trying to handle everything in the best way to make sure that we're safe, to make sure that nothing dangerous comes, that nothing attacks us, that nothing is going to make our survival less likely. So what it does is it attempts to orchestrate, to control, to take charge of everything to make sure that it's got it all handled. So the three basic issues that the ego deals with that Michael was alluding to are the concept of approval, like I need other people to think I'm doing okay, you know, the the basic need for control, I want to make sure that it works out the way I want it to work out, and then the judgment, I want only good stuff around me, not I, not stuff I think is bad stuff, but only good stuff. And, and so that those three basic concepts, the, the need for approval from others, the need to control all the circumstances and situations, and the need to make sure that you judge everything, to to only have the things you want around you. Those three ego fears are to protect us, to help us to survive, but they actually become, as we call the show, the driving force of our life. Yeah, exactly. Now, why have a fear? Why design a universe where people are so afraid of everything? It's a survival thing. Steve mentioned this. But we also have an overriding consciousness and awareness, or how about we just talk about intelligence? And so beyond survival is learning and growing and expanding, developing, uh, expressing our potential, becoming more. And in order to do that, we have to learn to manage these fears. It's almost like the brain has a gearbox or a transmission. And when facing danger, real or imagined danger, The brain gears down, it shifts down into this fight-or-flight mode, sees everything as one way or the other, everything or nothing. That means in that mode, all differences, all variations are opposites, complete opposites. Like instead of multiple choice, everything becomes true or false. That's part of the judgment of the ego, acceptance, control, and judgment. This is what it does in an attempt to purge itself of fear. Now, let's explore this a little bit, the fear in each of these areas. What would the fear be in having an inordinate or exaggerated need for approval or acceptance? You might say, well, I, you know, we all just want to be loved. We like those hugs. It helps us to feel safe and to feel connected. That's the nature of love. The problem with this, many philosophers and psychologists and and anthropologists and sociologists might argue is that it's really dangerous to think of love as a commodity that you either give or receive. 
It's much more appropriate to think of it as an electromagnetic field, a, a matrix of energy that attracts. We can feel the attraction in a loving relationship. And we're both magnetizing this frequency of love. But the love we feel is our love. If we think of love as a commodity, then we're going to need to get it from other people or from circumstances or situations where we feel accepted and approved of. It's a childish need that, because it's often not fulfilled in childhood, carries over into adulthood. And sometimes this is called codependence. But take a look at the way this is a fear-based function. I need your love. And the antidote to that, of course, would be, no, I'd love your love. I want your love. Acceptance, approval is a nice thing, but I don't really need it because I have self-respect. In a balanced, and I would argue even humble way, there is such a thing as being prideful and thinking that you're somehow special and that, as in superior, but to think of yourself as special in the sense of just different and becoming the best you can be, not better than others ever, but certainly not inferior to others, to shift that codependence to emotional independence and understand that nobody can take away my self-respect. Nobody can have my rock and roll. Nobody can have my self-respect. You say that, uh, you know, approval is a childish thing. Well, absolutely it's a childish thing because as children, especially young children, we absolutely do need the approval of our parents. I mean, our very survival depends upon it. From our point of view, if what we do makes them unhappy and then they withdraw their love from us, that hurts. So we get that we got to do what they want us to do to get the love to make us feel good. It's almost a performance. It is. And it's like, you know, basically I'm remaking myself in the eyes of my makers, you know, whatever mommy and daddy want me to be i'm molding myself into being that as best as i can on some level you know because i get rewarded for it and i get punished for doing otherwise so so there is a natural need for approval that children have but there is a point in life for young boys and young girls this, this age of adolescence when we need to individuate we need to like separate we need to say i'm today i am a man i'm today I, i'm a you know now i'm going to separate myself from the need of approval of my parents and others and refocus my energy on my approval of myself, self-esteem, self-respect. And there's so many cultures that have actual rituals about, you know, entering uh, womanhood or entering manhood, you know, and becoming uh, separated from the parents, no longer dependent upon others, but now an independent being. So it seems to me in our culture, a lot of the reason that people have such a strong need for approval is because that process broke down. It was at some point they never, ever really did get over the need for the approval of mommy and daddy. Even if mommy and daddy have passed away, it's sort of mommy and daddy in their own mind looking at them and, and like uh, making them feel guilty or make it, making them feel. It feels like these dead people are making me feel a certain way. Well, that's because we haven't created the separation. We haven't broken the need for approval. And once we can break that need for parental approval and approval of our authority figures, so to speak, those, once we break through that, we can have reverence for them, we can have adulation for them, but we no longer need their approval, everything changes. Yeah, it occurs to me uh, nothing really is harder than getting the approval of somebody who died in the meantime. <laughs> yeah, makes it tough, but it can be done sort of in your mind. Well, again, you know, Fritz Perl's empty chair technique yeah, yeah. is a great one, or basic hypnotherapy with visualization. You can have somebody imagine that they're in a movie theater or a screening room with a remote control, and with a little visualization, bring mom or dad or... Whoever had the audacity to pass over before I finished my business with them into this situation yeah. where we're so suggestible, where the the imagination isn't second guessing. It's not saying, are you sure this is real or is this just imagined? 
the subconscious, the imagination. Doesn't know the difference. Doesn't care. You know, I, I have many, many more conversations in the 47 years since my father left than I had in the 12 years I actually had him in my life. Yeah, the, the adult conversations. Yeah, those never, conversations right. to get over the issues I, I have with him abandoning me. So, you know, yeah, you never really can actually talk to them again, but you can get over what's left, the residue that's inside of you. I think that's the great thing about psychotherapy and hypnotherapy and these self-encounters where you do the the inner child work is that you get to take with you the person you've become. And that often doesn't occur to anybody who's afraid of doing therapy or, or frightened of self-examination and say, hey, the good news is this really smart person that you've become, they get to come along. That's right. And the stuff that was really incredibly overwhelming when you're nine, now that you're 59, doesn't seem quite so Makes scary. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, right. Well, no wonder. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course I would feel that way. It's so liberating. and. And again, obviates the need for what we're talking about. But that's the realization or the enlightenment that we seek after we examine the fear-based nature of these driving forces, acceptance, the need for acceptance, for control, and this real drive that we have to judge everything as right or wrong or good or bad or my side or not. We're going to talk about redeeming it and what to do in its place. So control is the second area I think we should talk about. This need for control, again, is fear-based. You can see how or feel or hear how it comes out of a a survival thing. Self-defense, people will say, well, especially men, I, I have to defend myself, don't I? And my response to that is no, not usually. And if you do need to defend yourself, well, what did you do to put yourself in that kind of a position? There definitely are situations, ethical circumstances, uh, matters of principle where you have to stand for something. And perhaps a search for control in this area is best understood as controlling what you do with it rather than the stimulus. I think this is where the mistake is made primarily in this basic driving force that is the desire to control. It occurs to most of us that that control should be expressed over what's being done to us, the stimulus. I need to control the person, to control what they say or what they do. I need to control these events and circumstances, which, by the way, are usually beyond your control, right? But that's where the mind goes. If only I could control this situation. How about controlling your response? How about accepting the stimulus? If you can influence or persuade, fine. But what's called for, I would say, is more acceptance of the reality of the situation you find yourself in or the nature of the relationship that you're in, like trying to please unpleasable people. We talked about what if they die on you. Well, What about just trying to please people who refuse to be pleased? If you persist in your need to please an unpleasable person, you're setting yourself up for a lot of frustration, a lot of anxiety, a lot of suffering and discontent. But when we shift that to, well, how can I look at this and express control in my point of view? And even more to the point, What kind of response can I initiate here and and choose the response consciously as an expression of control? That that often doesn't occur to us when we're stressed out by the fear. Remember, that's what the ego is, basically a first responder to fear and anxiety. Yeah, I was thinking about how, you know, we really don't have a whole lot of control over what happens in our life. So, yeah, we can put ourselves in the right place at the right time. Sometimes we can have some control, but stuff happens, and and a lot of times we don't have any control. We're blindsided. But I remember reading um, a book written about how, how to hit a baseball and written by famous baseball players, Ted Williams, among others, great hitters, and their their theory on how to hit a baseball. And what became very clear from oh, oh, the overview of all these points of view were – 
you don't really have much control over what the pitcher throws. You know, you can't change the pitcher's mind or make him throw anything. What you can do, though, is put yourself in the frame of mind to be ready for a curveball or ready for a fastball because you perceive that's what's likely to be thrown because it's three and one and the bases are. And you can put yourself in the place where you have the fastest possible reaction uh, and can have the best response to whatever is thrown. So by focusing in on trying to control what the pitcher throws like oh I, I he, he like trying to change the pitcher's mind you waste all of your energy what you need to do is put yourself in the mind of being ready for whatever it is the pitcher can throw uh you know this pitcher doesn't have a slider so you don't have to prepare for that but you know it's either going to be a fastball or a curveball well if i'm ready for the fastball and it's a curveball i have time to adjust so it's it's not changing what happens out there it's putting yourself in the best position to deal with what happens. And that's where we can have control. In fact, that's where I think the power in our great life comes from, the control of that perception, the point of perception, that point of what mood am I going to put myself in today? Am I going to just allow myself to have the same mood I went to bed in, or am I going to change it? Am I going to take the the attitude that I'm going to face life with today and make it any different? Am I going to be in charge of that particular part of my life. How do I see, how do I perceive the world that comes into me? And then, of course, from that point of view, I have much more control over choosing my response. Just like with approval, we don't want to get rid of approval. We want to take it away from needing it from others to approve us to our approving ourselves. Well, it's the same with control. We want to take it away from trying to control the stimulus and put it on to controlling your perception and your response. Circumstances where we want to be in control because of our fears of what will happen if we're not, often include expecting ourselves to be able to manage other people's emotions and their thoughts and their behavior, controlling other people. But look at the emotional nature first. In fact, in the best context, uh, somebody who might come to you as a friend and say, you know, I'm really struggling here. I don't know what to do. I was hoping you could help me, here's the situation. And as they explain it to you, their basic fear is if they do what they need to do, somebody else is going to be hurt or disappointed. And so they're confused. They're asking for your help. What do I do? Well, the proper thing to do is give due consideration to how other people feel, maybe even act on it, express it, have a conversation with them. But Other people's feelings are basically their responsibility. What's frightening about that is that means your emotions are your responsibility. And it's often more frightening, it's just scarier to think about managing and understanding your own emotional feelings. What a nice distraction here to need to control the way other people feel. And, well, I just didn't want to disappoint them. I didn't want them to to feel bad or to feel sad or, I'm sorry, I have to fire you, (laughs) right? Uh, And yet people are in that situation. Nothing personal, but I'm going to have to hurt you, cause you this pain. You know, there's a reality in that we certainly do have an impact on other people. Hear me clearly. This is not an either-or kind of an argument. We do have an impact on other people and can take responsibility for the style, right? The, the way in which we speak to people. We can be kind. We can be understanding, empathetic, and diplomatic. But at the end of the day, a person needs their feelings. Let them have their feelings so that you can then Have your feelings. Be responsible for the way you feel. And control takes a very different meaning here. It's not repression or oppression. You might think of that as control. In the most negative way, that is control. But to lift that up, to redeem that sense of control with responsibility for your own feelings is simply to understand them, uh, to process them. Uh, so that they're un- understandable, manageable. I, th- I think about uh, most grain needs to be rolled or crushed or certainly boiled before it can be eaten. It's, uh, the, the nourishment of the grain is just not available until it's processed and broken down somehow. Well, emotions are in some ways very much like that. You have to turn them over in a relaxed mind 
contemplate, sit intuitively with an emotional feeling before the intelligence in that emotion comes forward and begins to teach you about yourself. So I don't know, you want to call that control or not. I think really it's not control. It's it's management. It's understanding your own feelings. But clearly the beyond the benefits that come with understanding yourself better is giving up this need to always be in charge of how other people feel. That's really not your job. Right, because you know, it it is okay to influence others and to mentor others and to assist others and help others and in, interact with others in lots and lots of ways. What's not okay is to want to control others. And how do you know when it's control or when it's not? It's real simple. If the outcome you're looking for is more in your best interest than in their best interest, it, then it's control. So take a look at what, what are your motivations here? You know, it's, it's wonderful to help and to assist and to mentor and to help other people in all kinds of ways. But if you're doing it for you so that your ego doesn't have to face a certain situation or that, so that something happens, you know, if you're doing it really not out of the goodness of your heart, but really fear-based in a fear-based way, then you know that that's about controlling other people. Control is a wonderful thing. I love that I can control my responses, that I don't, that everything I think I don't just say, you know, everything that I, you know, I'm, I'm so, so happy that I can control lots of things in my life. What I don't need to control is other human beings. They need to control themselves. And if I'm trying to control them and they're trying to control them, there's a conflict going on and who ought to win that one? It seems to me they have a, a greater right for self-control than I have to control anyone else. So, you know, it's only common courtesy to let people control their own lives. Again, you can influence, you can you can help them in lots of ways, but if it's about your best interest you're looking for, then that's not helping somebody else. That's really attempting to help yourself. Yeah, the weather comes to mind. You know that old saw about everybody complains about the weather, but nobody does anything about it? Of course we can't manage the weather, but the response, that's why we have weather forecasters so that we can better manage our response. A sailor will say, well, I can't control the wind, but I can trim my sails. A good sailor has a way of sailing into the wind by zigzagging back and forth and picking up a little bit of wind that way. It's a matter of managing your response to a situation rather than what's done to you. It's a pretty profound concept. Going where the weather suits my clothes. That's <laughs> <laughs> well said. Now, the third area is for me the most fascinating why we do this the need to judge everything right like your judge judy or judge wapner or your god and this is your job again some aspect of judgment makes perfect sense to be a discriminating person uh, we had a conversation one day a group of us and uh, my wife was part of it and we were talking about what does it mean to be non-judgmental. And somebody pointed out, well, you know, you, you do have to be discriminating in, in ways that make sense, ways that are relevant. And my wife, Doreen, said, yeah, like you don't invite the known pedophile up the street to babysit your kids and say you're being non-judgmental, right? That's <laughs> just not a smart idea. So we do have to be discriminating. You you approach a, an intersection when you drive a car and the light is orange. You have some decisions to make. Do you roll through that orange light? How long are they again? Do you sort of go into your body for the feeling? Do I keep going? Do I jam on the brakes? Right? Those kinds of decisions present themselves to us countless times throughout a day. But in the larger sense, what we're talking about is this we're calling it a driving force here. This need to decide if something is good or bad or right or wrong or again like the gavel comes down and it's adjudicated as your side or their side, all black or all white, everything or nothing. You're either with us or against us. And so much of what passes for thinking is this perpetual orientation throughout our day, pulling these elements from the thought stream, the stream of consciousness, or the, the train of thinking when it's not applied. And in the background, I would argue, even when our thinking is applied to something like reading a book, there still is that flow in the background. You just may not be aware of it. And 
So much of it is judgment. Yeah, a lot of it is acceptance and the need for approval. A lot of it is the control, that desire, that driving force we just discussed. But so much of it falls, you could call all of this judgment in a way. You could say, well, this is the big basket that this whole exhausting effort of having to decide throughout my day, is this right or is it wrong? Where is the room in my life for, well, I'm not sure yet. Let's see how it plays out. My general attitude is all things tend to work together for good, even if I don't see how something that might appear to be a curse often turns out to be a blessing in disguise. And the truth is, I don't really know right now if this is good or bad. So why all this energy judging? Yeah, because what it creates essentially is from mild to severe suffering. You know, suffering is basically wanting the is to be other than the is is. And that's what judgment's all about. I mean, acceptance of what is, you know, doesn't have to be good, doesn't have to be bad. It just is. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. It still is. It doesn't take away or add to its isness by being good or bad. Some things it matters. Like if I'm going to take a piece of food and put it in my mouth, is this is this poison or not? Is this good? Is this bad? But like that was only like a mediocre sunrise this morning. It's not an appropriate kind of judgment you need to make. You know, I mean, you don't have to decide. Oh, that's a pretty tree. That's not a pretty tree. You don't have to. You don't have to look at everything and go. Oh, yes, that gets the the seal of approval. <laughs> I like that. Oh no, that does not meet my standards. We spend so much of our time. Everything we look at, everything we experience, comes through this filter for most people of judging it. Is it? Does it meet my standards? Is it good enough? Is it? Do I approve of this? Do I, do I want more of this? Do I want less of this? Instead of just going, "Wow, look at all that is. Look at look at that stuff. I mean, look at the stuff that is. It's not good. It's not bad. It's got lots of both in it. It's got a sh- shadow side. It's got a bright side. But wow, just look for what it is." Most of the suffering comes from judging things as being inadequate or in, in not enough or, or whatever, and, and that's trying to make the is other than the is is, and again, that's what causes suffering. Another way of looking at the problems that we create for ourselves when we knuckle under to this drive, to this apparent need to judge everything as good or bad, is it gets in the way of what is. Your attention becomes so occupied with the disparity between what you've decided would be the best and what actually is, so focused, so obsessed on that frustration and that anxiety that you miss 99% of what is actually happening. Like Steve said, the sunrise or the sunset. uh, You know, people come from all over the world to Maui, Hawaii, often to see the sunrise at Haleakala. And it's a long drive. It's a couple-hour drive for most people to get to the summit of that crater and be up there above the clouds as the sun comes up. And every once in a while, you'll hear somebody saying, well, it was too cloudy or it wasn't what I expected or it didn't look like it did in the tourist brochure. And it's like, wait a minute, this magnificent sunrise coming up out of the Pacific Ocean through the clouds, spilling out on the top of the clouds, pouring then into the volcano crater at your feet, isn't magnificent enough for you? Maybe it's because you're not paying attention to the is that is, as Steve kept (laughs) saying, right? Maybe this would be enough if we could but place gently our receptive attention upon it. You have to stop the judging. And by the way, the petitioning for acceptance and the need to control that's going along with it, these are the driving forces. And if your survival is at stake, I mean, really, physical survival is at stake, okay. We understand that fight or flight is going to step forward The middle of your brain is going, this is whole process with the amygdala. It hijacks all the higher brain functions, but it helps you to fight and it helps you to run in the short term. But again, the vast majority of our anxiety, as we discuss week to week, is really not about anything truly dangerous, but simply the anxiety and the confusion 
that comes from constantly petitioning for acceptance, this need to control that which is often uncontrollable, and the perpetual judgment. Is this right? Is this a good thing? Is this bad? My daddy always said the way I learned it when I came up was that, I mean, are we going to continue to be an accident of our birthplace and our culture, or will we learn to think for ourselves and observe from a place that has transcended most judgment and the unnecessary judging that we're talking about. That's most of what you do. There's still an opportunity to be discerning, but I'd argue it's easier to be discerning when you stop the judging based on fear. Yeah, it's all based on fear. All these needs for approval or acceptance, the need for control, the need for judgment is all based on fear. But the cool thing is, the stronger the fear, the more stronger the need, the less the fear, the less the need. So by reducing your fear, by feeling safer, because you can't get rid of fear other than replacing it with feeling safe. You know, fear is not a real thing. It's an absence of the feel of something safe. You know, there's not really anything to be afraid of. It's just you haven't filled yourself up with enough safe. So by becoming safer feeling, then the need for control and approval goes away. But what you see most clearly is the need for judgment begins to lessen. It will never disappear. You'll always have that need to be discerning, that need to be discriminating, that need to keep pedophiles from being your babysitter. But the safer you feel, the more the ego realizes, I'm not in any survival danger here. Therefore, I can step out of being in the driver's seat and and move over to the passenger seat and ride shotgun. I don't have to be on alert all the time, making sure everything is safe, making sure everything is judged as not dangerous because I'm living in a safe and not dangerous place right now. So once we feel safe, and of course paradise we call that feeling of feeling safe inside, once we feel safe, the need for judgment goes becomes less and less and less, and then all we have left is the habit. We don't have the driving force anymore to, to need to judge. We just have the habit of judging everything. And once it's not based on emotion, once it's, it's not based on survival needs anymore, that habit becomes easy to change. It's where the, there's a strong emotional attachment to a habit that it becomes very difficult to change. But once we break the emotional attachment by feeling safe, then just the habit of judging. So what happens is once we're free of that emotional attachment, we can see things and go, oh, yeah, you know, I used to judge that as being, now I'm just going to accept it. You know, I just, oh, there's another thing I used to, oh, but now I can just. Oh, there's another thing I used to judge all the time. Now I can just accept it. And once we get to the place where the is is fine, just the way it is, not to say that it, it's not going to have to be better in the future for me to be happy with it, you know, not to say that I don't want to have some, some ability to change my life and make it better and better and better, but for the moment, this moment right now, everything is what it is, and I accept that. I don't need to judge it as being dangerous or safe because I'm in a world that's safe. Then we can take charge of that habit and then pretty quickly eliminate the the massive need for it in our lives. So let's review the antidotes in each of these cases. The the overall strategy is pretty simple, to give up these driving forces and substitute for the fear that is at the root of each of these, the understanding, the, Stephen and I call it paradise. He was just explaining this idea of paradise as a meditative or contemplative level where you can reflect and with a quiet mind and a calm emotional nature allow yourself deeper and often quite profound insights into why you feel the way you feel and why you've been thinking and doing the things that you do so in place of this fear starting first of all with acceptance the larger strategy is simply to accept yourself That means you're going to have to understand what is worthy of acceptance. You're going to have to know the self that you accept. In other words, what's so damn lovable about you? You're going to have to begin to discover that for yourself. You could ask your partner, your spouse, your best friends. You could take a poll. It might help a little bit, but essentially this is a process you cannot delegate. To know yourself, to know thyself, as the old Greek said, supposedly, according to Plato, inscribed over the oracle to Apollo at Delphi in what for Plato was ancient Greece, a thousand years before Plato, right? Inscribed over that temple were the words, know thyself. 
imagine going to church or temple or synagogue, uh, especially because you got a problem in mind that you want to petition God to help you understand. And on the way through the door, you're reminded it's really about you, you see. It's really your life, and these are your feelings, and these are your thoughts. And to keep projecting out into the world as if the problem is out there, and therefore the solution must be out there, is to make a grave mistake. To create desires that are going to lead to a lot of anxiety and a lot of discontentment. A lot of suffering, if you will. All of that, why can't I feel good enough about myself? Or why can't I have more control in this situation? And what's good about it and what's bad about it? That judgment, these three areas. Well, let's start, first of all, with the antidote to this driving force that I need other people to approve of me and accept me. How about just making that your job? in a humble kind of a way. We talked about false pride, but we're talking now about healthy pride. So it's not a healthy self that believes it's superior in any way or fears that it might be inferior in any way. The The gentle focus is upon your uniqueness, your individuality, and And that allows you to be better and better in a way that's just different from everybody else. Not better, not worse, just different. Find your self-respect and your self-confidence, your self-esteem in I'm unfolding as a unique being. And I'm not better or worse than anybody else because I'm one of a kind. Yeah, and acknowledge that there was a time when you needed the approval. I mean, there was a time when you were inside your mom. You needed everything from her, and then you were born, and the cord got cut, and you still needed a whole bunch of stuff. And your very survival was based on the fact that you could get the approval from these big people, you know. Well, as time has gone on, you've needed less and less, and now what we're saying is there's another psychic cord that needs to get cut and no longer need the approval of others, parents representing the whole world of others, and now being willing to need only the approval approval of yourself. Not to say that uh, we don't appreciate and accept all the approval that happens to come our way. It's a wonderful little gift and a little bonus, but the only need we have is to approve of ourselves. And and to do that, of course, we let go of the guilt and the shame and the embarrassment and all the stuff that, that we're attached to in the past. We let go of our fears and judgments of what could happen bad to us in the future, and we just accept who I am right now is a work in progress, you know, and it's, it's exactly as good as it is, exactly as bad as it is. I accept it, and yes, I have plans for making it an even better me, but for right now, I'm all I need, I'm all I got, I am what I am, and I approve of that, you know? Yes, there's changes, yes, I have flaws, but hey, I'm where I am, and and I, I have everything I need in my own approval. All right, then the strategy for releasing this fear-based force that's driving us to try to control the external world, the antidote for that. Release it, give it up, let it go, and commit yourself to managing or controlling, if you will, your perception and your response. All right? Yes, there may be times, as Steve was saying, that you could influence or persuade and may want to pursue that behavior. But you don't have to put all your eggs in that basket. Influence and persuade to whatever degree you can and remain in your ethics. But then drop back to how many different points of view, how many different ways are there for me to look at this, and how many different responses could I consciously initiate instead of reacting knee-jerk and ending up being perceived as a jerk. I'm sure that's where that came from. We can consciously choose to manage or control, if you will, our perception and response. And then the second point, I think, that acts as an antidote for this driving fear force of needing to control the world around us is to begin to consider that we're we're micromanaging our lives unnecessarily, that things often work out all by themselves. Maybe that happens a lot of the time, 
And if we would sort of get out of our own way and move more in tune with the flow in our lives, there is a flow, there is an energy, there's an ebb and a flow, there are rhythms in life. There's a number of systems that are available to help people try to tune in better to these biorhythms or other rhythms and Again, the ebb and flow, all spirit, all energy oscillates and vibrates. It has an in-breath and an out-breath. So you work with that. That's not controlling it, you see. That's just managing it. It's a much better word for working with the ebb and flow in your life. Yeah, for many, many people, their primary pastime, both in applied thinking and in picking out from the stream, is attempting to control the future through a process called worry. You know, thinking about what could happen and what you would do if it happened and trying to control and make things happen a different way in the future. And, and you know, that's a waste of time. I mean, it's, it's basically putting a lot of energy into stuff you don't want to have happen and making it even more likely to happen. But there's no control over the future in terms of through the process of worry. The way you control the future, if in fact you can, is to co-create it, is, is to focus on what you do want instead of what you don't want. If you have any effect over the future at all, it's not in preventing things from happening, but rather creating things happening. So what we want to do is we want to, as Michael so often said, not get rid of problems, not attempt to live in a problem-free world, but rather become better and better problem solvers. Uh, we want to be we want to be the middle linebacker in football who's ready for whatever, whether it's a run or a pass. You know, whatever's going to happen, I'm going to be at my best. I'm going to react, respond to it in the best way. I, I can't control what they're going to do, but I can control the way I perceive it and the way I respond to it. No matter what happens, I'm on my toes. I'm, I'm on the ball. I'm ready to handle whatever life has to toss to me. And I'm excited about not knowing what's going to happen. I'm excited about there being this incredible unpredictability and amazing, you know, change and growth and stuff that happens in life. And I look at life as a, uh, this wonderful game, this wonderful learning process that I have an opportunity to, to play. Now, if we look at it that way and, and not need to control what comes in, but just being on our toes and ready to handle whatever comes in in the best possible way we can, then we're putting control in a place where we actually have some. Putting our eggs in the basket of attempting to control what happens to us through the process of worry spends a lot of our energy, a lot of our psychic energy wasted on something that at best does nothing and at worst actually helps co-create what you don't want and taking the time and energy that you could instead put into becoming a better co-creator. And then the antidote for the perpetual judging, this third driving force, ego-based, fear-based, needing to judge everything is essentially just giving it up. Uh, the absence of judging, I'm going to call witnessing. Uh, how about paying attention or just watching without judging? And, and it's not like I'm not going to judge, so therefore I'm not going to pay attention. It's a more mindful attention that you are allowed to focus upon gently when you take a step back, when you breathe and relax and let go and pull back a little bit, zoom out get a slightly bigger picture. Then we recognize that the judgment is usually unnecessary and often not very wise. There's a great story in Eastern philosophy about a man who loses some wild horses that he had corralled. And he says to a sage who happens to live nearby, I lost my wild horses and that's a bad thing. And the sage said, well, maybe it is and maybe not. Well, the man's son goes to retrieve the wild horses and succeeds, gets most of them back in the corral. And so a few days later, speaking to the sage, well, my son, he corralled those wild horses, most of them anyway. I got them back, so that's a good thing. And the sage said, well, maybe, maybe not. And shortly after that, the son was trying to saddle break one of these wild horses, and he was bucked off and broke his leg. And a little later, when the man saw the sage, he told him that story. Ah, my son fell off one of those wild horses, broke his leg. Surely that's a bad thing. Sage says, maybe, maybe not. And soon thereafter, the military came through, looking to draft men for the war, for the foreign wars. Surely this young man would have been taken, but for his broken leg. 
And so you never know what's a good thing, what's a bad thing, and what is this fear-based drive that we have to make a decision and obsess on it so that we miss all of these other opportunities. Even when they're developing right in front of our face, we don't see the context because we've got the blinders on. We're focused on having decided, oh, this is a good thing. Oh, that would be a bad thing. And often, where's the truth? (laughs) That's right. It's in the middle. It was mostly good, but it had a downside to it. Oh, it was a disaster except for this one little redeeming bit. It could be anywhere in the middle, 60-40, 90-10, right? Are there absolute truths? Perhaps. It's arguable. But the vast majority of truth in the world is subjective. It's personal. It depends upon your point of view. It's variable. In other words, it's a relative truth. It's very important as a critical thinker that you're able to go beyond the binary nature of absolutely one way or the other. Get out of the end zones and back on the playing field. The end zones are out of bounds. There's nothing happening in everything or nothing. That's out of bounds. Get back on the playing field. It's always some combination, some part of that pendulum swing, never the extremes where truth is found, except I should be careful. Even a word like never tends to move in that direction, doesn't it? So again, you know, I think there probably are absolute truths in a spiritual sense, but we have to acknowledge the relative nature of truth. And that certainly helps us to be less judgmental and more discerning, I think. Are you coming from fear with that judgment? Or are you coming from fear in a sense of being separated and threatened that's causing you to do that judging? Or is it a simple discernment, a recognition that you make that hopefully is intimate and personal and really about you that doesn't come from a fear place but from a peaceful, loving disposition? So the antidote to judging as much as you judge is to get out of the fear, is to feel safe, and then to recreate the habit of, instead of judging, accepting. Look at the world now. Take that step back, that place Michael was talking about, that witnessing place where you're observing your thoughts and feelings, and notice where in the past you'd have had a thought and go, that's a good thought or that's a good thing or a bad thing. Now you go, that's a thing, that's a unique thing, that's an interesting thing. Let me observe that thing as a thing, as a separate and wonderful thing. Instead of deciding to like like it or not like it, just look at it, just observe it, just experience it. To create the habit of not having to give everything a letter grade, oh, that's an A or that's a C. To, to get out of the habit of going on a 1 to 10, I think this is better than that. To not have to compare everything to everything else, to just get to the place of seeing, accepting, and being okay with everything being the way it is. Now, we can't start there. You have to start with feeling safer. Because as long as the being inside of you is full of fear, then the ego thinks it needs to judge everything because one of those things might be dangerous. But But once you start feeling safer, then you have the choice of choosing to change the habit of automatically judging and replacing it with the habit of automatically accepting. Not to say that that judgment part that discerns, that that discriminates, that makes the important calls will ever get turned off. It's just, it's such a busybody. It's such a nosy Parker, to use the terms I just read in that book from the 1930s. It's it's like so intrusive. It wants to know everybody's business. It wants to make everything, you know, and, and it's just most of the rest of the world is none of your business. <laughs> and, and once you can like go, oh, the world is what it is. And, you know, except for those things that directly concern me, I'm going to just accept it all. Stop judging everything that you see, everything that you hear, everything that you find out about and start to accept. There's a whole lot less suffering that comes through acceptance than that comes through judgment. Yeah, it's scary, this idea of acceptance as if it's giving up all your power and giving up all control. Again, a nice context shift for you here is to consider, as we've often said, acceptance is a place you begin. It's not the destination. It's not the end or the conclusion. Therefore, you just give up and throw in the towel once you accept that you have no power at all. It's no. This is the point where you initiate a new behavior, wiser, smarter, and that's leadership and freedom. All right, We're running long, so let's do a, a quick little mini 
audio journey and help you take a look at your intention and a nice, effective way of releasing our preoccupation with these three driving forces, all fear-based, the need for approval, acceptance, or love, the need to control the world around you, what's happening to you, and this obsession on judging everything as right and wrong or either good or bad, rarely in between. Close your eyes and relax. Feel the letting go of muscular tension in your body. Take a nice, slow, deep breath or two as you allow your emotional feelings to become calm and you simply watch your mental nature quiet down from eight or ten thoughts allowing Steve and I to guide you to four thoughts to just a couple and feeling calm safe, and relaxed. Calm, safe, and relaxed here in paradise. So with your mind's eye or just a sense, look around you 360 degrees and see that it's safe in every single direction as safe as you please. And knowing now, right now, you're safe, what you find is easy to do is let go of that need for approval and control and the need for judging, too. Because in this place, it's so easy to say, I accept all that is. There is no suffering in this place. It's virtually all bliss. And practice here, where it's very clear, there's no danger anywhere near. Feeling free. To take that need for approval from others and put it on the self. To take that need to control the stimulus and put that on the shelf. And take that control and put it on to your perception and your response. And no need to control what happens so much. Let that one go and move the flow to how you feel and how you deal. And with less danger and more feeling of safety, the judgment need, it just dissipates. There's no need to make sure that everything's safe. No need to see what awaits. It's safe out there. Not a care. So you can let the judgment slip away. Just take that step back and witness and you'll find most of the judgment goes away. Yeah, you'll see things, you'll experience things, you'll observe things for sure, but you'll see them just as you see them. Everything's clean, everything's pure. No need to decide it's good or it's bad. No need to decide if it makes you happy or mad. No need to decide anything at all. Just accept it for what it is, great or small. In this place, practice being much more judgment-free. And you'll find when you leave this place and return to your reality, you can bring that along, feeling very strong and able to take that step back and get out of that rut of judging everything and get onto a different track of just acceptance of that which doesn't matter and that which just doesn't influence you at all. Just accept it is exactly what it is great or small. And with that acceptance comes a feeling, a wonderful feeling inside. And that feeling is the great feeling of acceptance where the judgment used to reside. Wise women and men have from the beginning of time agreed that the only benefit of self-realization or enlightenment is a peaceful satisfaction, a contentment. It comes out of understanding 
that everything is just fine as it is. It's perfect. Does it need to be changed? Sometimes it does. Something that's evil, something that's hurtful, something that causes suffering can be redeemed or uplifted, transmuted, transformed. There's really quite a few words in the English language for this refinement, this improvement. Simply acknowledge the longing in your heart to make a difference. But to do it gently, the way you would cultivate a garden, working with natural energies rather than pushing the river or fighting against nature or needing reality to be other than it is. And accept as a place of beginning where you initiate either a whole new behavior or a more enlightened response, returning negatives with positives, Returning violence with gentleness. Returning hatred with love and fear with understanding. So take that need for approval from others and accept that you only need to approve of yourself. Take the need to control the circumstances and what happens to you. And know that you need only to manage your perception and response. And take the need for so much judgment and bring it to a higher place where it's now just for discernment and discrimination and in those very special cases where you need to do that. But in other cases, you'll find that instead of judgment, what now comes to mind is acceptance, being willing to let what is be is. And to recognize that whether it needs to change or stay the same, it is what it is. So release the need for approval and control and judgment too. And you'll find that with the love replacing the fear, you become a better you. And now, as it feels comfortable to you, become aware of the external circumstances you find yourself in, the room you're in. Bring yourself back to the present reality, consciousness, and with a deep breath, open your eyes and bring yourself back to Wide Awake. Feeling fine, better and better. Happy New Year. By the time you listen to this program, it's conceivable that you already missed the Maui retreat. I sure would like to think that you're listening to this program in advance of the retreat so you can make a a decision to join us and. And for five days, immerse yourself intensively in a study of mindfulness. This very sense of detachment that expands your view. Think of the word to be mindfully detached is actually to be more involved with, but from an elevated point of view, with a grander perspective of what actually is. And You find the joy and the happiness, the the peace of mind, and really the intelligence and understanding that's available in living moment to moment, rather than living in those stories that we rehash, those stories that we repeat over and over in our heads to ourselves, sometimes to each other. Those stories are just your stories. That's just one version. You're telling yourself those stories for some particular reason. You're getting some sort of payoff from it. But if you're stuck in the same stories, you're not growing, are you? You need to move on. Let us help you with that. Come and join us in this Walden-like experience. You know, Thoreau said he went to the woods to learn to live deliberately. I would offer you that same invitation. Check out focusedpassion.com and click on the Maui Retreat button. Come and see the pictures anyway. It's such an incredibly <laughs> beautiful place. You know, We get it every day, but it's, it's something you can never have enough of. It's just something I wake up every morning and feel so grateful and appreciate. Well, 
enjoy uh, the retreat in your mind if you don't actually come. But if you do, we look forward to seeing you the weekend of, or the week, the week of Valentine's Day and uh, February 13th through 18th. Hope to see you there. As always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Benner. Aloha from Maui. <laughs>